The very Reverend Dr. Gregory Jenks is an Australian religion scholar, an Anglican priest. Prior to his current appointment as Dean of Grafton, Dr. Jenks was Dean of St. George's College in Jerusalem from 2015 to 2017. He is an adjunct senior lecturer in the School of Theology at Charles Sturt University and executive director of the Centre for Coins, Culture and Religious History. His research interests focus especially on biblical history, including Galilee at the time of Jesus. He is also the coin curator for the Bethsaida archaeological excavation in the Galilee. His recent publications include The Once and Future Bible, 2011, The Once and Future Scriptures, 2013, Jesus Then and Jesus Now, 2014, and Wisdom and Imagination with Rex Hunt, 2014. And you can see more details of his publications on his website, www.gregoryjinks.com. Would you please join me in giving a warm welcome to our speaker today, Dr. Gregory Jenks. Thank you, Greg. All right, uh, thank you, Phil. Thank you for that introduction. And let me uh, begin by acknowledging the uh, Karingai people uh, on whose traditional lands we're gathering. So we give thanks for their custodianship of this beautiful place for so many thousands and thousands and thousands of years. If you do try and add up all the dates in the Bible, as Archbishop Usher of Ireland did about 300 years ago, you give, go back about 6,000 years. Well, the indigenous people have been here about 60,000 years. So it's a lot longer story than what we would find in these texts that are so important to us. So we acknowledge them and um, I'm sure their, their elders, past and present, as well as the emerging elders of those people, are watching with interest what you guys are going to do on Saturday the 18th of May. So we'll see. We'll see what happens. We will be watching. For some reason, something about this seat, there's somebody in it that <laughs> lots of us have heard about. So I want to thank those responsible for the invitation to be with you today. And um, what I want to do is move through my material fairly quickly, because actually I don't think it's all that exciting and interesting. I mean, for me, it's very familiar stuff. But it goes to the question of how much does the Bible control and, and how much does the Bible for, uh, kind of open up and facilitate the conversations we need to have about our future on this planet. Um, and I know that's actually a fairly contested topic in areas south of Newcastle and north of Albury. So let's see, uh, let's see where the conversation goes today. So my basic thesis, as you'll know, is that we're we're wanting to, wanting to look at how we might read scripture as a charter for the human spirit, as something which opens up the possibilities rather than as a set of documents which limit our understanding of what it means to be human. When I was first uh, invited to come and give this talk, um, I was asked to, well, it was kind of the suggestion was that it's a kind of inter-church council event, so it should be relevant to the church, churches. It should be uh, have some relevance to the ecumenical movement and it might also address in some way um, the role of the church and the voice of faith in the public square. And of course in the, in the months since that invitation, I guess in many ways, that um, the questions around religious freedom and um, what exemptions, what, what permission to discriminate churches might seek to preserve and claim. So these are topics that have, have some interest, perhaps. I'm not, of course, speaking as a politician, and I'm very glad that I'm not a politician. I'm not even a senior church leader. I'm just a humble parish priest of a very small cathedral in a tiny little country town about 100 kilometres south of the real city where I was born. 
but we won't go into the rivalries between Lismore and Grafton this afternoon. So I've moved in and out of seminary and university teaching, but um, have also, in that moving in and out, I've often found myself working as a parish priest, and that's indeed what I'm doing at the moment, of course, as Dean of Grafton. And as Phil mentioned, it was, it was in that role as, de of, as Dean of Grafton that I was able to, uh, to, to, to um, act as a voice for the community. Uh, when the news broke that not only had a terrible massacre happened, not only had the killer been an Australian, but worse still, the killer was from Grafton. And that really shocked the community. And so it was, it was, um, it was a good thing and it was somewhat a reassuring thing to see that uh, the church can still speak with both a pastoral and a prophetic voice into the real shared lived experience of our of our community. So what we're going to be doing um, what we're going to be doing today is to be teasing out the role the Bible might have inside and beyond those communities of spiritual practice that we know as churches. And the core idea is perhaps fairly simple, um, although it might represent something of a philosophical challenge to some of the religion gatekeepers in, in this part of the country. I want us to explore the possibility that, that, that the immense cultural and spiritual significance for Christian scriptures lies precisely in their capacity to inspire us to move beyond earlier ways of being human and to reach new levels of awareness, of courage and compassion. To put it bluntly, and it's only one example, but I'll come back to it shortly, we learnt to do that with slavery. Okay? About 150 years ago, that was a hot topic. And we can learn to do it with sexuality as well. In short, the scriptures give us permission and they also give us spiritual resources to be more fully human than we've ever managed in the past. And, um, and what better way to honour the Creator than to be as fully human as we can be? That's our job, surely, as humans. And that's true for us at the individual level, I want to suggest, and also at the collective level. I'm sure it applies equally to the sacred scriptures of other spiritual traditions, but as a Christian priest, I'm going to limit myself simply to speaking about the, uh, the value of the Bible in this particular context. Some years ago, in fact it was almost exactly 10 years ago, almost to the day, a colleague, a friend in Brisbane rang me to say he was going to speak to a men's group in a couple of hours time and he wanted a six pack to take to the event. He wanted a six pack of dot points about the Bible and he'd like it within 30 minutes. Thank you, Greg. Sure, Mervyn, no problem. So I, I actually revisited those as part of a Facebook discussion in the last week or so, um, and I was interested to see what I'd said. On the, I think it was about the 9th of May or something, 2009. The Bible was mostly written by ancient Jews, a few of whom were followers of Jesus, though probably none of them had ever seen or heard Jesus during his lifetime. I realise that would be contested at Moore College, but that's a pretty non-remarkable comment in the larger world of biblical scholarship. Secondly, most of the Bible was prepared for oral presentation via live performance in community gatherings where people came together for worship and mutual support. The Bible was not written, in other words, for close study, line by line, by literate and highly educated individuals from Mossman and Neutral Bay. It doesn't stop us reading it that way, but it wasn't written with us in mind. Thirdly, the Bible has very little to do with history, even though, of course, there are some historical elements embedded in it. It wasn't written as a history text. In fact, in the Old Testament, repeatedly it says words to this effect, 
if you want to know more about King so-and-so, go and read the Chronicles of the, of the Kings of Israel. Go and read the Annals of the Kings of Judah. In other words, there's a historical record, now lost, somewhere else. That's not what the Bible is about. Didn't we overlook that footnote? The fourth, the fourth one was that decisions on which text to include in the Bible were mostly determined by the political needs of Jewish communities after Alexander the Great and of emerging Catholic Christianity in the third and fourth centuries of the Common Era. That's the way in which the decisions were made. I was particularly surprised and relieved in a way to see this fifth point. I've obviously been thinking about today's topic for a few years. While the Bible has been used to validate prejudice and oppression of various kinds, it can also be used in ways that enhance humanity and encourage respect for the earth. Bingo, that's what we're talking about today. The last one, this is like a scriptural health warning. The Bible is best read in the company of other people so that we benefit from the wisdom of others as we seek to hear what the Spirit is saying to the church. Nothing remarkable really from where I come from after 40 odd years of being a priest, but I realise having used these myself as discussion topics with young people and others, we very rarely get through all six of them even after an hour and a half because they open up so many cans of worms as part of the discussion. So that fifth one, as I mentioned, is the one that I want us to focus on today. How do we use the Bible not to validate prejudice, not to claim the right to discriminate, not to get permission to, to oppress other people, but to use the scriptures in ways that enhance humanity and encourage respect for the earth? I'm going to offer a few suggestions. We really probably don't need much to remind us of the relevance of this kind of topic for the communities in which we're living at the moment. We've recently come through the marriage uh, debate, marriage equality debate, the plebiscite, the postal plebiscite, remember, from late 2017. Congratulations to you guys. I think it was 75% of your community, not counting your member of parliament, who voted in favour of that particular item at the plebiscite. And we know there's unfinished business there, but we know that both sides, and particularly the conservative side of that debate, likes to draw on the scriptures to say no. Doesn't matter what the question is, no. We're not changing nothing. And so we go into the religious freedom debate, which has been brewing up in the lead up to the, um, to the plebiscite and in the preparation and passage of the legislation and of course ever since with the Rudd Review and so on. And then there's a football player who's become even more famous than he already was because of posts like this. I couldn't have asked for Rugby Australia to time things better than this weekend. As we speak, they are consulting their lawyers and their risk managers to work out how many millions of dollars this is going to cost them. Okay? The significance of the scripture for how we speak and what we say and how we treat each other in the public space. So the process I want us to follow is that basically we'll set aside some of the more familiar but rather pious and devotional concepts about scripture. Things like the idea that God wrote it, or that it dropped out of heaven, or that Paul used the King James Version, if it's good enough for Paul, it's good enough for me. All those kind of things we can leave aside. That's a joke, by the way, obviously, in case you're not sure, Paul did not use the King James Version. He used the Emperor Justinian. No, he didn't. I'm sorry, I must stop being naughty. He actually used the Greek New Testament, of the Greek Bible. The New Testament was still being written. And if you go to your local Greek Orthodox church, probably called St. George's, they are still using the same copy of the Bible, version of the Bible, that Paul used. It's called the Septuagint. It's the Greek Bible. They're still using it. 
Okay, so if we want to use the Paul, the Bible Paul used, go and get a Greek Orthodox Bible. We want to think about the real world spiritual value of the Bible. In other words, what practical difference does the Bible make to the choices we have to make in our everyday lives? Whether we're doing that as people of Christian faith, whether we're doing it as spiritual but not religious people, they're probably your kids or grandkids, whether we're doing that in conversations with people of other faiths, whether like most Aussies increasingly we're people without faith, remember the fastest growing category in the census and the religious question is no religion. And, uh, and in a place like Grafton, where believe it or not, 27% of town still says they're Anglican. I haven't said that in Sydney for a while. 24% um, say they're Catholic and 25% say no religion. And the other 15 Christian brands are squabbling over the remainder. And then, of course, there's this secular Commonwealth of Australia of which we are citizens and in whose well-being our own future lies. So we're going to be talking about how basically how to use the Bible faithfully and I'm going to soften you up a bit with an example based around slavery. Then we're going to tease out what I mean by, by biblical literacy and then, um, and then we'll focus particularly on the biblical case for same-sex marriage, which I know is a, it's a boring topic. Sydney has dealt with it. It's no longer an issue, but just bear with me and we'll see how we go. So we, we've all perhaps come across people like Marcus Borg saying, uh, we, want, we need to take the Bible seriously without taking it literally. And that's very much the space I'm coming from. But I want to up the ante a little bit. because I want to say that taking the Bible literally is in fact not one valid option among several. It is a category error. Okay? So I want to switch the onus and say, no, no. It's not that we have to apologise because we're using that we're taking the Bible seriously but not literally. In fact, it's nuts to do it any other way. Okay, to take the Bible literally is not a valid theological option for anybody with a scintilla of theological and biblical and religious literacy. But rather, it's a serious mistake and it has toxic consequences for the individual, for the church, for the wider society. Whether that's the suicide rate amongst young gay persons or whether it's the Israeli occupation of Palestine, this is what happens when you take the Bible literally. Okay? People die. People lose their land. So I'm going to speak plainly. I'm not going to engage in mealy mouth theological ob obfuscation. I'm just going to say things how I see them because this is, after all, a festival of wild ideas and crazy persons. I'm not sure the second phrase was in the advertising, but uh, we'll add it in, okay. We're going to ask questions, we're going to push boundaries, we're going to get a sense of the way forward from where we are to where we sense that we need to be. And that's why we're meeting here rather than in the upper hall at St Luke's, because then we don't have to get permission from the gatekeepers in town. So the venue invites us to think outside our traditional theological boundaries for the sake of everyone. So let's take the example of slavery. These days, I'm sure, there's not even a church in Sydney which would entertain a proposal to reintroduce slavery into our economy and into our family structures. They may quibble over taking a strong stance on domestic violence and other things, but no Christian leader around town is going to say, you know, I think slavery is God's plan for humanity, especially for coloured ones and for people whose languages and food choices are different from mine. It is good for business, so that's a plus, isn't it? And it has strong biblical support. But we don't want to go there anymore. Something happened in about 150 to 200 years ago. And actually the things that happened 
150 to 200 years ago were led by evangelicals who because of the way they read scripture came to realize how important the human person was and therefore slavery had to go even though it was very biblical interesting exegesis during the US Civil War the churches in the north and the south of the country split over the issue of slavery and even today many of those divisions are still there in the denominational structures of the Lutheran Church and the Baptist churches and the Presbyterian churches and possibly also in the split between the Episcopal Church USA and the so-called Anglican Church of North America it's interesting to map where power and privilege um, overlaps with racism and um, the slavery debate. Slavery provides an example of the Bible inspiring a few activists and, and social advocates to develop new ideas that are controversial, radical, overturn millennia of tradition, and involves setting aside some parts of the Bible itself for the sake of a deeper truth. That would never happen, right, in a church today. But it might just sound a little bit familiar. Slavery, let me remind you, was embedded and taken for granted in the social structures of the biblical narratives. Slavery included sexual exploitation of female slaves and actually probably male slaves as well. In the Exodus account, the Hebrew slaves are liberated from Egypt, but slavery is not condemned. And the laws which God supposedly gave them, while they were camped around the base of Mount Sinai, included regulations for slavery how to deal with Hebrew slaves, as well as how to deal with non-Hebrew slaves. Slavery was embedded in the Constitution, even for a bunch of runaway slaves. Slavery features, of course, in the parables of Jesus and is never criticised. It's a favourite term in the New Testament for people to describe our relationship with Jesus. And when we come to that fascinating little one-page letter, which we call Philemon, a letter from Paul to a Christian slave owner called Philemon, who had a runaway slave called Anesimus, which interestingly is a Greek word that means useful. Good name for a slave. Handy. <laughs> handy, handy. So in that, Paul doesn't say, you know, Philemon, as a Christian, we should not be having slaves anymore. He says, um, thank you for sharing Anesimus with me. I'm sending him back now. Of course, you will treat him well. And by the way, get the guest room ready. I'm coming to stay. In other words, if you don't treat him well, I will know. But he doesn't challenge the institution of slavery. The New Testament um, endorses slavery. And at no but, interestingly, and only in one verse as I recall, it condemns slave traders. There's an interesting little nuance in the tradition. Slavery is fine. We take that as a given, but none of us are to be slave traders. Slave owners, yes. Slave traders, no. Interesting nuance, little wrinkle in the text of Scripture. In summary, slavery is assumed in the scriptures. It's regulated by divine laws. It was widely practiced. It continues to be accepted even in the New Testament itself. It provides a core metaphor for the person of faith and for major leaders within the church. And it's even embraced by Jesus as a metaphor for his own mission. I came not to serve, but to serve others. I didn't think I touched it, though. I must have done. Now, these days, we tend to prefer to translate the Greek term doulos as servant. 
but its ordinary meaning in the first century was slave, we get a bit embarrassed about that. Okay, so we translated as servant. But almost every one of Paul's letters started, grace and peace from God the Father, the Lord Jesus Christ, from Paul, doulos, a slave of Jesus. Okay, more than apostle, the big, the big word for Paul was doulos. Now this is much more biblical grounding than we find for lots of other cultural practices which later on will acquire profound theological significance in the Bible and within later tradition, including minor things like marriage, divorce and celibacy, which you'll find hardly anything on in the Bible, lots and lots about slavery. And in short, anything involving sex or gender, which seems to get certain gatekeepers in the church quite agitated. If you go to most of the uh, cafes and restaurants around here, you'll see some version of this sign reminding us of the obligations of the licensee for the responsible service of alcohol. We're all aware of that. I want to suggest we need a similar program for the churches. We should have stickers up on the doors as you come into the church saying this church is committed the licensee of this premises is committed to the responsible service of scripture we will not use the bible to mess with your head okay now of course we do have such a program it's called biblical literacy it's not a new idea let me just outline briefly what I think are the elements um, of biblical literacy. Of course there are seven, because that's the perfect number, isn't it, in the Bible. But anyway, there are seven dot points, as you were, that I want to uh, suggest. And we can unpack some of these and kick them around before you tar and feather me later this afternoon. So the first thing is that if we're going to have any sense of biblical literacy, we've got to be paying attention to how a written text actually works. What kind of an act of communication is happening between an author and her readers? This is true of the Women's Weekly, it's true of the Sydney Morning Herald, it's true of, of your favourite novel, and it's true of the Bible. What's going on? What's the deal between the author and the reader? And no matter how much the author Wants to, wants to communicate a particular point of view, actually what happens is in the hands of the reader. The reader determines the meaning. The author can use all kinds of strategies to, to guide us in her absence, to how she wants us to engage with that text. But in the end, we decide what that character is like and whether we like them or not. That's the nature of text. And so if you have a religion in which a sacred text has incredible power and influence, we're into communication theory. And we cannot be biblically literate if we're not intentionally paying attention to the very essence, the very nature of the relationship between a text, the author, and the reader, especially when the author is either unknown or contested, which is certainly the case for the biblical texts. Secondly, literacy, including biblical literacy, requires us to pay attention not only to the question of text, but of course to the nature and the function of language. Humans, and maybe one or two other species, have created, and humans in particular, have, have refined the skill of language to create knowledge, to share, to adopt, to implement and to adapt, and to transmit that knowledge between individuals and across, and across, across different generations. And all of this is particularly true for the scriptures because these are texts which have themselves traveled from one culture to another to another to another they've traveled across time they've traveled across different languages 
and, and they are now being read in different cultural contexts. And perhaps, the, and I'll come to one of these in a moment, but perhaps the biggest change in cultural context, context is what we think we know about the way the universe is. Okay? We imagine ourselves to be living in a very different universe than Paul, for example, imagined himself to be living in. We may be no more right and no more wrong than Paul was, but, but certainly we think we live in a different world than Paul thought he lived in. That has an impact on how we use the Bible. Biblical literacy also means that we actually have to pay attention to what we might reasonably know about how these texts came to be. We cannot just pretend they dropped out of heaven. We cannot just pretend that every evening, the end of a long day on the road, Jesus sat down with Peter and said, listen mate, you better write down some of the dot points from today. You're going to need them in a couple of decades time when Mark goes to write the gospel. That's not how the stuff was created. Okay, and we do know stuff. We know something of the composition of these books. And the more we know, it's not a case of finding the less we know, the more we know, we actually find that the books are not as ancient as we thought they were. And that it's increasingly likely that most of the books of the Old Testament were written either, not only in the Persian period, but possibly the Hellenistic period. That has profound impact, implications, for the way we approach the Old Testament. Okay? I was um, horrified, uh, not surprised, but I was horrified when watching um, Christians Like Us, filmed in a city like yours, just a few weeks ago, because one of our friends, um, the young Anglican priest with the dog collar around her neck, Tiffany, she's just been appointed as our diocesan archdeacon of the Diocese of Grafton, footnote, not to be repeated outside this room. Very brave choice, Bishop Murray. Okay. Tiffany is on there. Remember there was the, the second session, there's a debate about abortion, and uh, one of the um, charismatic pastors simply reads Psalm 51, I was wonderfully knit together in my mother's womb, and so on, and treats that as the words of God. It's a psalm for heaven's sake. It's the hymn book from the temple. They're not the words of God, okay? But simplistic, literalist understandings of scripture take us nowhere in terms of biblical literacy and responsible service of scripture. Not only do we know a lot about the composition of these texts, but we also are increasingly coming to understand how these texts were received, uh, adopted, transmitted, preserved, commented on. The oldest complete copy of the Bible is what's called Codex Sinaiticus. It's actually the oldest book, physical book in the world. It's a physical book from the fourth century of the Roman Empire. Still, it's not a copy of a copy of a copy of grandma's copy. This is an actual book, um, a codex from the time of Emperor Constantine. Okay? Uh, it's the oldest Bible in the world. Well, apart from anything else, its canon is not the same as our canon. It has different books in there. Probably they forgot to mention that at your confirmation class anywhere around Sydney in the last few decades. But we, we, we find that even a text like that, um, there are variations from other examples. For instance, the beginning and the end of Mark's Gospel are different from the King James Version. Surprise. But there are handwritten corrections in the margins of the beautifully um, sort of written calligraphy, if that's a verb, um, Codex Sinaiticus. Even in the next couple of hundred years, people are saying, no, that's a mistake. This bit should have been added in. This book should have been taken out. Even in Codex Sinaiticus. There's a, there's a history of reception as the book is being loved. And like Grandma's table, the Bible has scratches all over it. Okay? Now we can take it to the furniture restore, we can sand off all the scratch marks and revarnish it, or we can remember those scratch marks are the story of a family who lived and dined and argued around that table generation after generation 
and the reception history of the Bible is something like that. Pushing on with biblical literacy. Um, it's not only that the texts themselves have a history, but of course people have been reading these texts for more than 2,000 years. And we can learn stuff by peering over their shoulders and listening to their conversations. One of the most interesting um, commentary sets you can buy is what's called Ancient Christian Commentaries on Scripture. And it collates together comments from the early fathers, but arranges them in the biblical sequence. So as you're reading 1 Corinthians whatever, 15, you'll see all the different comments by different generations of early Christian fathers, and they were blokes, about that passage. So we're listening in on the conversation. We're seeing how others have read these texts before us. And if we don't pay attention to how others have read the text, even if we now disagree with them, then we're not demonstrating biblical literacy. And then there's the point that I uh, alluded to earlier. We have learned an immense amount about the physical and social realities of being human in our kind of universe. And all of that has implications on our contemporary reception and interpretation of the biblical texts. If you go back and look at the pyramids in ancient Egypt, they built those pyramids because of their understanding of the universe and what they thought happened to people after death. Now we would say, wrong. You misunderstood reality. You didn't understand what happens to people after death. You don't need to kill all your slaves and take them with you to look after you in the next life. But because of the way they looked at the world, the pyramids and the mass killings that went with the pyramids made sense. We read the world differently, so we must read the Bible differently. And then there's this tiny, small, little insignificant thing of our own lived experience. The best way to convince a loving but conservative person that being okay, being gay is okay, is when their granddaughter or grandson comes out. But I love that person. So does God. Well, something's got to give. Yep. And it shouldn't be your love for that person. It may be the way you read the Bible. The way you think about life has to change and love will always win. So let's move then to the question of living with diversity and particularly how this will apply perhaps in the question of um, same-sex marriage, which in one way is a topic we've dealt with and in another way it's a topic which is probably going to blow the Anglican Church up by the end of this year. Okay, so it's not just a, a ethereal topic to be discussed in obscure theological think tanks. Gender stereotypes, we know, are an issue, that, a set of issues which have wider cultural interest and profound implications. And when we're aware of the, of the debate, which continue to roll on, and once the election is over in about, what, 13 days' time, we'll go back to the culture wars and we'll go back to the debates about um, safe schools programs and uh, protection for religious, religion schools and churches and so on. So these are topics that are relevant within the wider community but are also controversial and relevant within the life of the churches. But we have a track record for being divided and split and, and, and um, all bound up with controversy, it seems to be deeply embedded in our DNA as Christians. In fact, as I mentioned in the sermon this morning at St. Luke's, the very first bit of the New Testament to be written, which is not the Christmas story, but the letter to the Galatians, is itself written because of, of a debate, a fierce debate in the early church as to whether male Gentiles had to be circumcised. These days, if we were being balanced, we'd call it male genital mutilation. Okay? 
men get circumcised, women have female genital mutilation. Interesting how what we consider normal affects the language that we choose. So from the from within the first 15 years after Easter, we have been at it, arguing over things, particularly things to do with sex and food. So shared meals between Jews and Gentiles, male genital mutilation. Interesting, this one. Opposition to military service and to empire. Queen Victoria would not have been amused, but the earliest Christians refused to serve in the military and were deadly opposed, as it were, bad pun, to, of course, the Roman Empire. They knew what empire does, the prophets. Non-traditional music and worship, well, we don't want any of that, thank you very much. But it has been a cause celeb over the years. Icons and images of various kinds, and as we've already seen, slavery as recently as the 19th century. Well, slavery as recently as the last time you bought a Samsung or an iPhone, actually. So then let's look at, let's address one of these topics. Let's look directly down the barrel of the debate around same-sex marriage and look at some of the biblical and wider theological grounds for same-sex marriage. And let me just... I'm good if my notes roughly correlated to what I'm saying. Okay, so the first topic of, that I think we need to put on this, I'm going to list again half a dozen topics. And I really hope we're going to kick these around in a few minutes in discussion. The first, top, the first topic is to, is to do with the limits of Biblicism. And by, by Biblicism, I mean an exaggerated and inappropriate sense of the authority of the scripture. Okay? The roof didn't fall in. There we go. So what kind of authority does the Bible actually have? People talk about the authority of the scriptures, and I've spent my whole life as a biblical scholar, as a priest, as somebody taking the Bible incredibly seriously. But when push comes to shove, what is the nature of the biblical authority? I noticed, for example, that well-known footballer who has particularly nasty views about the um, ultimate destination of a whole lot of us, breaks the Bible's prohibitions on tattoos. Apparently you can pick and choose which bits of the Bible are authoritative and which of the bits of the Bible are only cultural or ritual, but they're not faith questions. They're not authoritative. And we know that. It's a game Christians have played for hundreds of years, the canon within the canon. Because the Bible, like any other text, has to be read and we are selective in what authority we give to different bits of the Bible. So how is the authority of the Bible exercised? Is it prescriptive? Is it descriptive? Is it literal truth? Is it metaphorical truth? Um, and I, I gather there's a point of view around these parts that the Gospels are descriptive, but Paul is prescriptive. How convenient. How terribly convenient. Because then we could ignore Jesus and run with Paul. And isn't that a lot of fun? So what are the extra-biblical influences and considerations which are driving the way we use the Bible to address and to resolve theological debates? And this is the uh, topic, of course, about tattoos on various people's arms. As soon as, of course, as soon as we, we want to invoke the debate, well, that's just cultural, which we all do. Okay? That's why we wear shirts that are, that are mixtures of different sorts of fabric, which is against the teaching of the Bible. That's a cultural thing. It's not a core promise, as a politician might say. We all, have, we all find ways to create wriggle room for our own convenience. Then there's the fact that issues to do with gender and sexuality are actually marginal faith issues. Now that's primarily because, until fairly recently, they weren't seen to be issues up to debate. If you had a penis, you're a boy. If you didn't, you're a girl. Now, a pretty simple 
reality people live with. So people, people didn't, didn't think there was much in that debate. Okay. And so not surprisingly, in ancient societies where there were very strict rules and procedures around the relationships between gender, marriage was controlled and so on and so on and so on, these things don't feature as items that are up for grabs, up for discussion, up for debate. Interestingly though, where they do occur in the New Testament, particularly in the Gospels, not so much in Paul, it's because Jesus and his followers are claiming the freedom to modify the ancient traditions, not to reinforce them. Interesting. Jesus, of course, famously opposes divorce. He also chooses not to marry or have children, and he welcomes women with unconventional sexual histories into his community of followers. He's breaking the boundaries. He's crossing the taboos. When we look at the authentic letters of Paul, the ones that think there's a reasonable argument that Paul might have had something to do with creating the content, and that comes down to seven out of the 13 letters attributed to Paul. Clearly, Paul is somebody who's challenging gender stereotypes, including by his own practice. He even says in a wonderful passage, I think it's in 2 Corinthians, where he says, this is not for me, but if I wanted to, I'm entitled to have a sister wife come with me on my travels like the other apostles do. But I don't want a sexual comforter to travel with me on my missionary journeys. They probably skipped that bit in Sunday school as well. It's there in the Bible. Okay. Paul, of course, challenges gender stereotypes, and in particular, he encourages celibacy between married couples um, so that they can focus on their prayers and not be busy little beavers making lots of babies to fulfill the command of creation. That's the only reason we have sex, right? To make babies. And Paul says, well, no, actually, stop doing that. Just, just go and pray. In the Deuterone Pauline letters and the Pauline and the pastoral epistles, we see the second and third generation of Paul's movement adopting a much more traditional view of marriage and of other domestic relationships, including slave ownership, as Christianity becomes more conservative at the end of the first century moving into the beginning of the second century. In fact, apart from when we find the tradition transgressing the inherited traditional biblical purity codes as a sign of the kingdom of God present among us, matters relating to sexuality and gender and marriage are peripheral and are not central to the gospel. Then there's the old acorn of marriage in the Bible. Traditional biblical marriage was a great thing. Just ask Solomon. Okay. 300 wives, 600 concubines. What a roster that must have been. Okay. But then ask Abraham or Sarah or Hagar or indeed any of the other characters in the Old Testament marriage, Old Testament narrative. In other words, biblical views, the biblical tradition about marriage and intimate relationships is diverse, to say the least. In the words of a recent movie, it's complicated. There are many, many things about the Old Testament in particular that contradict current mainstream Christian views on the family, including the right to stone to death teenagers who talk back to their parents. Tempting though that may sometimes be. The Bible inscribes and reinforces, of course, particular ancient cultural practices relating to food and sex, because that's when humans are most intimate with each other, most vulnerable to each other, and most at risk. These practices include male domination, otherwise called patriarchy, female subjugation, other side of same coin, polygamy, never at marriage, that's where if the lady dies without having kids, sorry, if the first husband dies without the woman having a child, 
brother number two moves in, and if he dies before she gets pregnant, then brother number three moves in, and so on. Okay? Great, great role for the woman. Ethnic taboos, concubinage, rape, and sexual exploitation of vulnerable persons as instruments and acts of war. It's all there in the Old Testament. These, of course, are, are cultural views which are integral elements of a social system that also included capital punishment, just like the 39 Articles, by the way, slavery and ethnic cleansing, but are no longer widely accepted by Christians, one hopes. So it's kind of a bit complicated if we want to invoke the teaching of the Bible on marriage. And even that notoriously liberal, wishy-washy notion of, of um, so progressive revelation becomes a bit problematic because it never seems to progress very far when it comes to women's issues, the status of women, questions of marriage, and so on. When we look at the uh, when we look at the topic, the, the kind of the theological field of creation theology, and that's in many ways particularly connected with the work of Matthew Fox, who, by the way, will be in town in the middle of July for the Common Dreams conference. Creation theology is about looking at the world differently and valuing creation as something intrinsically good, not as something intrinsically broken, depraved and gone astray. So creation theology can affirm that gender diversity is a good and wholesome feature of creation. It is not aberrant. It's not deviant. It's not sinful. It's no more deviant or sinful than wrongly directed heterosexual activity can also be. When we go to the, that beautiful story in Genesis chapter 2, we find that the original earthling, and the Hebrew used there is Adam, which we know as Adam, but the original earthling Adam, Adam is made from the ground, and the Hebrew word is Adamah. So you can see the wordplay that's going on. Adam comes from Adama, and the better way to translate that, of course, is not Adam, as we lose the pun, but earthling. The earthling is created out of the earth, out of the ground. Okay. But the earthling had no gender. I know we read chapter 1 before we read chapter 2, but chapter 2 is a story in its own right. In fact, chapter 2 and 3 of Genesis is a self-contained story. It's the story of the Garden of Eden. The world is made differently in chapter 2 than it is in chapter 1. Sorry about that, that's just how the Bible is. It's not consistent, even with itself, even in the course of two sheets of paper. So in the, in the Adam and Eve story, in the Garden of Eden story, when God makes humans, when God makes earthlings, the earth creature is non-gendered. But God's happy with her work. In fact, God is so happy with her work that she trots off and makes all these other animals to bring along to the earthling to see if they might get along. They'd be good for each other. And Adam watches the kangaroo and thinks, no, no, that's not going to be any good at all, and so on. And remember in the story, eventually, God puts the earthling to sleep and out of the one earthling makes male and female. But to be human is not to be differently gendered. To be human is to be, be created by God, out of the earth, out of the dust of the earth, and to be good creation made just the way God wants us, with any and all or none of our normal sexual orientations. And there's a the question of God's bias to the poor. Priests may not be politically biased, maybe, but God certainly is. In scriptures, God has a bias for the poor, for the little ones, Read the Beatitudes, whether Jesus said them or not. They're canonical scripture. Read the opening scene of the Sermon on the Mount. Blessed are the poor, blessed are the hungry, blessed are those who mourn, and so on. And it's not a question of wealth, although it kind of helps. 
It's more a question of our access to the things we need in order to flourish. The common wheel, the common good, the common dream in terms of the Common Dreams Conference. So these are the people who are on the margins. Not the rich and powerful, they're normally doing pretty well for themselves, but the ones whose suffering and whose lack of well-being in many ways provides the economic and social basis for the comfort of the privileged. Now, LGBTI and Q persons are not among the poor and the marginalised, sorry, they are among the poor and the marginalised in our society, but of course particularly so, tragically so, in our churches. How can that be? Well, there's all kinds of historical reasons, but surely as those who are closest to the margins, those who have less opportunity to flourish in the way most of us for too long have looked at the world, then a bias to the poor begins to impact our hermeneutics, our interpretation. And uh, the, last, the last one I want to play with, and I would re you really hear me quoting these words, but WWJD, what would Jesus do? That's not a high profile slogan in the Diocese of Brisbane or in Grafton Cathedral, but um, let me tease you with it. What would Jesus do? Well, actually we know a fair bit about what Jesus would do because the Gospels give us lots of examples of what Jesus did do. And what we see Jesus doing in the Gospels is deliberately violating the inherited biblical rules concerning purity and social intimacy at meals. That's what Jesus would do. He'd break the rules. That's why he wouldn't be welcome in most of our churches. There's a total absence of any references to marriage issues in his teaching other than his incredibly strict views on divorce and remarriage, which almost every Christian community chooses to set aside because we don't find it comfortable for us. Let's recall the story of Jesus meeting the woman at the well. Her personal life had apparently been a series of relationship disasters and she wasn't even domiciled in Hollywood. Yet the focus of her discussion with Jesus was not her moral imperfections, but her, the theological differences between Jews and Samaritans. Jesus doesn't lecture her about her marital status, but invites her into the, gener into the generosity of God, which is expressed in his own ministry. Interesting. He's much more relaxed, much more comfortable in his own skin than many of his followers have been. And then there's the census fidelium, the, the shared understanding of the faithful. The census fidelium evolves over time. Once upon a time it was widely believed that emperors and kings ruled by divine favour and that to rebel against the emperor was in fact to oppose yourself to God. We live in a society that has some elements of democracy in it and so we don't buy that story anymore. Okay? We've moved on. The sense of the faithful has moved on. And the sense of the faithful is moving on um, to a new and more generous and affirming relationship. Now, of course, the census fidelium can be defined as what the faithful, what the Christians everywhere have always believed. But that's to take a bit of rough grade sandpaper to church history and smooth out all the bumps and make it all nice and smooth. That's not the real lived experience of Christians over 2,000 years. So we'll put the theological sandpaper aside and we'll recognise that the mind of the faithful is indeed moving to a more generous and affirming attitude to LGBTQTI um, persons and their place within the life of the church. 
This is not just whistling in the dark. We saw it in the postal ballot of 2017. The fact that you know, almost something like almost 63% of all Australians, 75% of the people in this electorate, the fact that they voted in favour of that reform tells us that not only do most Australians think that way, but so do most Christians. Especially the Christians whose faith communities are members of the National Council of Churches in Australia. The majority of God's people, of Christian people in, the, in our community, are in favour of same-sex marriage. That may be a slightly different soundbite than what you hear coming out of St Andrew's house. Explicit opposition to the full inclusion of gay and lesbian and bisexual, transsexual, queer and intersex persons in the life of the church, including solemnising their marriages, is increasingly limited to the fundamentalist fringe, to the ultra-conservative faith communities as part of the so-called culture wars in um, Western society. And, um, and we know, we know, and the Conservatives know where history is heading. So we need to find ways to use scripture well. And that means we're going to use scripture in ways that respect the nature of the documents, that respect the history of their composition and reception, that respect the lived experience of people of faith over the millennia. But we're going to put aside any temptation to use scripture as a tool to exclude and to oppress people that don't look and sound like us. And the Bible will no longer function as manacles on the human spirit, but rather as a charter for human flourishing. And so I invite you to now to move into a conversation with me as we tease out what that might look like. We'll deal with some of your questions and um, let's just have a really good discussion around how we use scripture and and how we can particularly how we can use scripture to make it to make it um, easier and more more inspiring to be as fully human as we can possibly be. Thank you.